Welcome to Public and Private Passions, a documentary series on artists and artisans living and working in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm your host, David Zoffoli, Executive Director of Creative Haverhill. Like every town and city, Haverhill has a vibrant community of artists and artisans that make up a creative workforce. These are professionals in a variety of fields, marketing, architecture, design, performing arts and music, visual arts and crafts, film, gaming, publishing, and cultural preservation. You may be familiar with some of these folks, and there are others who, for one reason or another, have mostly kept their talents hidden from the public eye, and you'll find out why. One thing's for sure, public and private passion for the arts is all around us. In public and private passions, we'll take a behind the scenes look at the passion that drives people to make something from nothing. It's a first hand look into the creative process and fortunately for us, creativity is everywhere. Today, we're on location at the Eagle Tribune and we're in the press room. It's pretty cool in here. This is where it all happens. Well, when Bill Cantwell pushes the button. You're going to hear about that in a minute. We're talking about the art of journalism and Bill Cantwell is an artist. Let's take a look. I think um, I think it's true that uh, that people generally don't see uh, journalism, newspaper work certainly, which I'm familiar with as an art form. But but I think it truly is. The process of uh, getting a newspaper story together is um, very simple at its origins, and then gets more complex as you go along. Um, initially, uh, you know, again, I may have an idea for a story as an assignment editor. The reporter might have an idea. We get together work it out, okay, we have the concept. Now, I take it, put it down on the, uh, on the screen here, just a brief summary on a, on a, on a uh, news list that I'll share with other editors. They may chime in a bit. But then, in essence, the reporter goes out and gets the story. He gets it written, forwards it to me. Once we get the bugs out of it, we're ready to go. I have it on my computer screen. I've given it a last read. As I like to say, I push the button. From there, it goes to our paginators. Uh, these are our layout people. These are the people who have a computer screen in front of them. Uh, that's, that's like, uh, that's like uh, putting a puzzle together. Uh, a reporter will work closely with a photographer when he's out in the field working on a story. Make sure that they take photos of people he speaks with. They take photos of, gee, that's the building I'm writing about there where the, where, you know, where the people were arrested, that sort of thing. Get a few shots of that. Photos, story together. They go to the, they go, uh, to the paginator who puts them on the screen, moves them around. And this is, this is a very, very creative part of our business, which is really making that page shine. So there is an art form with regard to, as we say, uh, above the fold, above where you fold the paper in half, the way it looks on the, uh, on the newspaper rack in the store, making sure that we have at least two strong elements, hopefully three every day above the fold. And also there are creative teasers that we use across the top of page one as well. So the paginator does all that work. He or she gets that puzzle together on their screen, they make a printout, what I call a proof again, which, which I and other editors will look over. Looks good, it's ready to go. We might tweak it a bit. Then they push a button. It goes to um, a composing area. They will take the image of the page that the paginator created. They will attach it to, um, uh, to metal sheets that then are attached to the printing press. And somehow ink runs onto them and that's how the thing gets printed. 
you know, you have an idea. I might have an idea as, as, as what's called an assignment editor. I assign stories to reporters. I might have an idea, a concept of a story that I think would work. The reporter goes out, starts to gather information. We sort of make a game plan who he's going to talk with and so on. He becomes creative in terms of how he approaches the story, uh, the kinds of questions he might ask. What, what, what is the information we're trying to get to, we're trying to get underneath this thing, not just surfacey info, but, you know, really interesting underneath kind of background, you know, the, the, the true heart and guts of it all. He'll ask us questions, then he comes back and he begins to write. And he, here again is some more art, if you will, the presentation of it. One information goes up higher, one information goes down lower. How do you draw the reader in? Just like a, a short story or, an, or a novel, you need interesting information at the beginning to draw them in to make them want to read the story. My true passion for Havel is that it is truly my home. It's my hometown. I'm an uh, adopted only child, adopted uh, when I was 10 weeks old, uh, back in 1959 by Helen and Bill Cantwell, and brought to Haverhill, raised there. I think if you're to define Haverhill, what you have today is this. It's a, it's a city that is very rich in history, first of all, settled in the mid 1600s. Haverhill had to reinvent itself, and it's taken time. Um, but I think it's done it, and I, and I think it really has taken time. It, it hasn't been as quick as many people would like, but I think now it's a place that's really diverse, and it's businesses. I mean, you see the downtown made, has made its comeback with restaurants and shops and lounges and that type of thing. The old shoe factories turned into apartments and condos. But it's also a very diverse place in terms of having an urban core that's, that's, that's very vital, a lot happening, a lot going on. Then you go out to its, uh, to its outer, outer areas, like go up Route 97, up towards Salem, go down some of the back roads. You've got a, a very, what I think is a unique mix of an urban core with a ton going on, outlying neighborhoods, uh, very rural in character, still have some farms, still have some working farms, and many different, uh, many different kinds of people. In many ways, we are like first responders. My, my uh, late colleague, Barney Gallagher, my, my dear friend, my mentor, who taught me so much, and people in Havel will know Barney very well, unfortunately passed away a short time ago, and we miss him greatly. He, his words were, you don't know if you don't go. And it's that simple, it's true. I mean, you can try to report something over the phone, but the best thing to do, especially in the case of an emergency, an accident, uh, a flood, uh, this kind of thing, an emergency, is to go. You need to witness it yourself. You need to talk with the people who are there, who are being impacted. You need, you need to witness how the, how the, if we are first responders, how the other true first responders, the police, the firefighters, rescue people, how they deal with it. There have been times that we've heard something on, on the scanner and we've beaten someone. We've beaten the true first responders to an incident. Um, and that can be very troubling. I mean, you know, in your heart of hearts, you want to jump in and help. And there have been times that, that people have tried to. We've tried to do that and you need to be a human being first. But you need to put that reporter's hat back on um, as quickly as you can to do your job. I would say a reporter's code um, is, uh, well, it's going to be a variety of things. Um, it's it's going to be, first of all, that you're, you're on the clock, you're on the job 24-7. If news happens and you're aware of it or it happens in your midst, um, you need to cover it. And that needs to be, it's really, as, as, as the old timers would say, in your blood. It needs to be part of you. Um, you need to want to do that. You need to be motivated to do that because you want to inform people. This is, this is what, you, what you really want. Uh, I tell the story of a, um, a fellow reporter here. Um, he was driving up here to the paper after having covered an assignment in Haverhill, and he saw uh, an SUV speed by him on his left, and suddenly the vehicle lost control, flipped over several times, and a young man was thrown from it. He wasn't belted in. The reporter felt that he had, he had just, unfortunately, witnessed someone die. He was very shaken up, pulled off the road, called me immediately. Uh, I said, are you serious? Yes, he said. I said, all right, pull yourself together. Are you okay? Are you safe? Yes, I'm off the road. I said, breathe. Are you going to be all right? And are you up to, you know, taking notes on what you've witnessed? Because we do have a job to do. Um, very stressful for a reporter to be in situations like this. We see these things. I have seen dead bodies. I've seen people pulled from, from the river after they've drowned. Um, it can be stressful just to be in those situations, just to witness these things. The other part of, of the oath, if you want to call it that, or, or of our belief system, um, has to do with, they used to say you can't be subjective, you need to be objective. Well, I'm not quite sure that that's entirely possible. I, the word I like to use is you need to tell a story honestly, as honestly as you can, as honestly as you witness it, as honestly as you hear others speak their words, as honestly as you read police reports, Take the information as truthfully and honestly from it as you can. And probably the other uh, main component to the, uh, to, to the creed of the reporter is to be, to be fair and balanced. 
uh, and as best, you, as best you can. And what that means is if you're going to write something about someone, you need to, to make a, a true, honest effort to get a hold of that person and or their lawyer to give them a chance to speak. There needs to be that balance you know, within the story so that both, both sides or sometimes it's not just two sides, that all sides get the opportunity to speak. You don't want to turn back. So the old-fashioned notion to stop the press costs a lot of money is, is really true. So you don't want to have to do that. I don't know that I've been in the room, but I understand that the last time the press was actually stopped at this newspaper, and forgive me, I'm going to forget the date on this, was when a prior sh uh, pope was shot when he was making a public appearance. Um, now, back in those days, uh, we were, uh, we're now a morning paper, so we, uh, the, we put the paper to bed, as it were. We, 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 we send it to the printing press uh, maybe two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Back in those days, we would put the paper to bed and it would, be, it would be printed very late morning toward noontime and it would be delivered in the afternoon. It was an afternoon paper. So I believe that happened. I'm forgetting when it was. I think I'm, I like to think I'm a good Catholic. I'm forgetting what year. Sometime in the 80s, I'm forgetting my history. But the Pope was indeed shot. The presses were stopped. It, it takes that kind of an event um, it takes that, that kind of a major news story for us to cause to stop, or frankly, it takes a major error to force us to stop, which is why we need to do our homework and be very careful before we send anything to the press. My favorite word is love. Um, uh, you know, I, again, I come from a very strong family environment, and um, uh, I think love is where it's at. Um, I like to think of myself as a strong Catholic. I, I, I have my own problems and I, and I deal with my own difficulties, but love your neighbor as yourself. Um, uh, love, love is a big word for me. It's, it's the counter, it's hate. I think it's a very strong word. Um, I, I, I don't believe I've ever used it. I hope not in my adult life, my vocabulary, except that maybe I might, oh, I might hate the New York Yankees, if you know what I mean, because I'm a, I'm a Red Sox fan. But I think hate is a very, very strong word, and I think people need to give more thought to it before they use it. I like this. Uh, I like the, there, there are two sounds, if I can give you two. One is the sound of the, the gentle ocean uh, just washing up on the shore. I like that very much. And I guess what kind of goes along with it is the sound of birds. Um, I like the sound of uh, seagulls at the beach. I like the sound of birds chirping, especially like early morning birds. Sometimes I might get home from work at two or three in the morning and there'll be some that are at that hour just, I don't know what their habit is, but they're getting up or they're going to bed, what they're doing. But the, the sound of birds chirping, it's a very vital sound, an, an innocent sound. Sound of violence, um, and when I, when I say violence, I don't necessarily mean purposeful violence, um, but it could be people yelling at each other, that kind of disharmony, but more to the point of violence in, ter in terms of uh, a screeching tire and then the sound of a thud, the knowledge that, that potentially someone, someone got hurt, that bothers me greatly. Again, I'm a family guy, a sense of harmony. Seeing my wife, my children, even extended family, uh, having great harmony. Um, a quick example, every year we have a mass for my, for my deceased parents and everyone comes to our home later and we make a day of it. And it's just wonderful to see everyone together in harmony, getting along. So that's, that is the kind of image that, that, that really turns me on, that I enjoy. Small-minded things, uh, bickering, gossip, talking behind people's backs, those kinds of things. I'm not going to say I haven't done it in my life. I'm not perfect. Um, I've seen my children do it occasionally. I like to gently but firmly correct them. Uh, those are things that, uh, that dynamic bothers me quite a bit. This is an easy one, um, teaching. Um, I've, 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 I've always held uh, teaching very, very high. Um, frankly, I considered going into it at one point, partway through my journalistic career. Um, uh, decided it, it really in the end wasn't quite for me. Did a lot of teaching over the years for about 10 years at um, a couple of my Catholic churches. I, I taught CCD, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, love working with young people. Like to think that here and working with reporters, especially younger ones who come in, uh, I am a bit of a teacher. So hopefully I'm fulfilling it somewhat. Probably be a police officer. As much as I like to see order, I think it must be very, very difficult for those 
both men and women to have to deal with some of the things that they deal with on a daily basis. Um, I don't, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd like that. I wouldn't be. I mean, I may be up to doing it if I forced myself, but it, it wouldn't be in my character to have to, to have to deal with the kind of challenges they have to deal with. It would be my hope that if I get there one day, if I'm, if I'm uh, worthy of getting there, um, I guess just very simply that 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 you were a kind person to others in life, um, that you live by the golden rule. Uh, that you were fair in your work, fair and balanced, and, and, and you, that, you, that, you, that you strived to make that happen. And that in the end, that I might somehow know that my, that my parents are proud of what I, what I did on this earth in their absence after they've gone home because I promised each of them as they were leaving that I would try to make them proud as I remained on the earth. Thank you. favorite word? My favorite word is like, excuse me, um, darling. Mm. What word don't you like? Swear. Que esta bien buena. What sound do you like? What, it is, what sound I like is like soft serenity. Esa es la que a mí me gusta, es la que tú tienes. El, cuando llueve y el agua cae en el, en el sink. And what sound don't you like? The water dropping, I don't like. You too? El ruido. And if heaven exists, what do you hope God will say when you walk in? Well, I hope he say, I'm welcome to your house. So we are not going to die no more, no more problem. You too? Great, you guys. That's wonderful. Where are we today? We're in a secret garden behind Copley Master Mark Hayden's studio here in Haverhill. Have you ever wanted to learn how to paint? There's no one better than Mark Hayden. Let's see where he works on his masterpieces in his studio. I think I was born with a little, sort of a, it's like a coal burning inside of me, you know, and um, I used to have dinner, lunch, actually, with my grandmother as, as often as I could, almost every day. She was an actress, she was sort of a, a well-known character actress back in the 20s, and she said that that coal, that thing that burns inside you, is how you explain why you're easily sort of hurt or you notice things that are beautiful, or you are quick to help someone, that sort of thing. He says that she said it was that sort of a, um, a thing that makes you have an interesting life. Uh, it gives you something to call on all the time. She was a great person, and both my grandmothers were uh, very inspiring. Uh, you know, it's been my really only home. My mother's mother lived with my parents on South Pine Street and my father's mother lived on Ferry Street just down the road. Haverhill's a great place. It's a frustrating place to live in because you look around and you say why do they choose that? But uh, the people are great. The location's great as far as you can get to Boston, you get to the mountains, you can get to the uh, lakes and the ocean. You can, I can walk down the street and find a pastoral scene that's I've painted 50 times probably. 
and I can paint it, I paint it any season, any aspect of it from the river looking back or, you know, Silsby's or the field across from Silsby's or any aspect of that, just within a walking, within walking distance. It's problem solving pretty much, I think, you know. Sometimes something will come to the surface. It's just an idea that's been lying dormant or, or uh, a scene, a place. With me, when I buy or prepare a, uh, a canvas, I immediately mess it up. I take what I call sludge from the bottom of my uh, paintbrush washer with a house painting brush and I just put a tone on it, just a sort of a mess of a tone to, to lose the the pristine quality of it because I, it's sort of intimidating to see that thing. So once I put my hand to it and make it make it a little bit uh, less than perfect, then I can f sort of freely paint because I don't draw and paint. I don't draw an idea and then fill it in. I just go from very broad to specific. So they seem to be accurate, but the, it's, a, it's a mess that lands in the right spot. I keep sort of chipping away at it. I think we're designed to see whether a person is friend or foe from a distance by the way the light and shadow falls on their gesture, their body weight. Uh, so if I can get that early, the shapes of the big dark parts, if I can get that accurately, the, you, you need very little detail. The anatomy is understood and then forgotten almost. Just because I come up with these games and it keeps my my calling pure, in a way. I didn't know what it really was for a long time. And I found different characters that I played because I had this burn and I didn't know what to do with it. I was too, I was too jittery to sit and paint or sit and draw or even learn how to draw and paint until I was 20 or so. But I, I had fun adventuring around and doing irresponsible things just because I had the burn and I didn't exactly have it focused and I was guided toward you know that this wise person said well what do you do that's positive I said well, I can you know draw a little bit I said well bring me some examples of your drawing uh, on Monday so I brought them and he said you should be in art school you should you should develop this this isn't what this isn't something that regular people can do that's all I needed Thank you, thank you very much. I enjoy the one that I'm doing at the time, I guess, and uh, it's funny because I can, I couldn't get up and sing you a song, but I could put a painting up and stand next to it because I feel like the painting is standing there by itself in a way. It's not like, hey, look at me, look at the painting. Say somebody is posing for me for these, uh, every Tuesday night I paint with my friends, over 25 years with these friends, and I'll look at them the person that's posing that I never know who it's going to be. 
and I just sort of forget myself. And f I feel like I'm wrapping myself around them like a ribbon. And I forget, I forget myself, I forget my ability, I forget all that. And I just, as soon as I dip the brush and slap it on there, I start shaping it and I forget. There was a time when I couldn't use my right hand and I thought, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna develop my left hand to be able to do this. Once the model sat, I was able to do it and there wasn't much of a difference. I don't paint for the money, but I want people to see my work and not want to live without it. So there's a need that I have for that. But I also don't really want to hear all that. I want them to love it and I want them to like it and I want them to like me and all that, but I don't really want to hear too much of it because I don't want to carry that to the next piece. Because all that stuff can really mess you up. Yeah, I mean, I remember it and it's nice and it keeps me keeps me going and I do think you know I mean I I do need it and I like it and all that kind of thing but I gotta try to put it someplace play another game put it someplace where I can deal with it painting I've been working on the past month or so usually I just paint I just run hot and paint it and done but this one has been cooking in my head for a long time so my, I play blues harmonica I play all kinds of different styles of music I guess on it but uh, blues is what draws me and Sonny, Sonny Boy Williamson the first one John Lee Williamson uh, lived in Chicago was born in Tennessee but lived in Chicago and the, he was making records and that sort of thing and making a big splash well around the corner from where he used to play was a butcher shop and this little 11 year old kid was wrapping meat for his dad in his, in his butcher shop and his father would play the Sonny Boy records and the father saw that the kid loved the music and bought him a harmonica and he started kind of catching up to it. So he said, you know, he loved this music so much. He says, this guy walks by the store every couple of you know, mornings and whatever, because he just lives there, works there. And the kid got so excited. It was like, you know, having Willie Mays, Jackie Robinson, somebody like that in the neighborhood. So he got his courage up and knocked on Sonny Boy's door one day and Sonny Boy invited him in and, and gave him a few lessons. So that story, I saw this interview with Billy Boy Arnold as a 60-year-old guy telling this story, and it, he just looked like a kid. His expression was just so so pure telling that story. And I could never get the story out of my mind. So I thought, well, that's going to be my leap of faith painting, where I visualize something, don't use any reference material, just draw it out of my head. So this painting is built on that. It'd be two words. Uh, my boys, if they're if I don't see them or hear from them in a while or whatever, hey Pat, it's million dollars. Failure. Beauty, beauty in nature, beauty in people's actions. Rudeness. Rain. Chewing. Can't stand the sound of people eating. I would love to be able to lay down those harmonica tracks for uh, commercials and movies and things like that. And they don't see me, but you know you hear, you know, beef, and you hear that cool riff. That I would love to be able to do that. I'm probably a Zumba instructor. I think he would probably say, check that list. Thanks for joining us. Part of what we do at Creative Haverhill is to identify, nurture, and promote our local talent. They make up today's and tomorrow's creative workforce that helps drive economic development. Throughout history, artists have always led the way in changing societies, and Creative Haverhill is leading that charge.
can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Just type in Creative Haverhill. you find us everywhere. Have a creative day.